Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Second Breakfast Podcast. I'm Andy Roth, and the terrifying vision you see in the other half of the video is my partner, Philip Duvall. Hi, Philip. I'm, I'm so scared. Okay. Okay. So I am. I don't want to talk about what we're about to talk about. <laughs> so last week, uh, at the end of our at the end of our Tuesday podcast, Phil gave me homework. We gave each other homework. Uh, I have completed mine. Phil has not had a chance to yet, and so we will talk about my homework. My homework was to see the horror movie House of a Thousand Corpses. Yes. Directed by Rob Zombie, who, let's be honest, I am predisposed to like. Because I like zombies. I, I'm i pretty sure that's his given name. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure he was born into the zombie family. Of the of the, of the the Westchester zombies? <laughs> Westchester. <laughs> I would not be shocked to find out that he was born and raised in Westchester. Can I say um, something about Westchester really quickly? After I tell you that he was born in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Close enough. Go ahead. <laughs> I think we are fine. I think I, that I, really... I wholeheartedly concur. So Andy and I, Andy and I went to a school in uh, a, a, a university by the name of Tufts in uh, 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 Massachusetts, and a lot of kids from New York went there. A lot of kids from New York. Yeah. And sure. there were a couple things that I hated about them. Um, not all of them. I, I mean, obviously, I love people. I, it's not a matter of hating everyone from New York at all. But there were things that certain ones of them did that were from New York that would drive me insane. One of them was a girl who, uh, when I asked her where she was from, now recognize that Tufts is literally 15 minutes outside of Boston, okay? Which is a fairly important city in American history. I concur. I was talking to this girl, and she, I said, where, where are you from? Uh, she was like a room, uh, uh, lived across the hall from my girlfriend at the time, and I go, you know, where are you from? And she goes, oh, I'm from the city. And I go, shockingly, I was naive, and I said, oh, you live in, oh, you're from Boston. No, no. She goes, no, New York City. And I was just like, you know what? So then, but see, now this, you don't know, this is this was when I used to be like way more argumentative than I am now. Yes, there was a time. Audience? Nah. No, no, it's nah. true though. Like it is yeah. true. Like I'm a lot it's more, true. I'm like a lot more willing to just go, okay, okay, <laughs> than I used to be. So I go, oh, really? What part? Of, of this, I go, well, first of all, you know, I said something like Boston's the city, but okay, you're from New York, so what part of New York are you from? What part of New York are you from? She goes, oh, well, Newark. No. Oh, you mean New Jersey? No. Which is a completely no. different state. That's not okay. Than New York. Well, I'm yeah, but I spent a lot of time in the. No, just stop. That's one. Okay. Here's uh-huh. my other favorite. Westchester is the suburb outside of New York City where a lot of people with uh, that are that have means, people means. of means, yes. people yeah. of means who mm-hmm. don't want to live in the in the city in the midst of the rat race, but still want to be close to New York City, live in Westchester. Yes. So I knew several kids who would say, um, you know, I was where are you from? Oh, well, I I was born in the city, but my parents moved to Westchester, as if. They're city folk, you know. Right. But their parents messed it all up by moving to Westchester. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, they moved to Westchester when you were in high school. No, like when they were like five or six. But they are city folk, Andy. (laughs) I'm a New Yorker. And my stupid parents who are paying for my entire college career and gave me that BMW I drive and the charge card, they moved me to Westchester. So whenever I hear Westchester, I giggle. Like, I can't help it. I'm sure it's a lovely place to live, Westchester. It is a lovely place. It is a lovely place. But anytime someone says Westchester, I'm like, (gasps) Westchester. (laughs) And I just imagine suburban children who are like, but I'm from the Bronx. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so what we're talking about today... House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> <laughs> Segwaying swiftly into... After Five Minute Monday, with such a deep restriction on our activities, I need to be able to say something about nothing, or else... You, you, gotta, whole... you gotta fly. You gotta, you gotta the... spread your wings and fly. <laughs> Clip my wings, Andy! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Get the net. Okay. Okay, let's so, do this. House of a Thousand Corpses, a horror movie. Uh, I am a big fan of horror movies. Phil you is are. not. No. Phil had seen this movie, and yes. I had not. And right. and he said, 
it really, really scared him. And so I was looking forward to it. Now, I, I saw it 10 years ago. Right. And I also want to point out that, again, since I don't see a lot of horror movies, I get scared very easily. No, 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 no. There's no judgment. I, there, I mean, there might be I, judgment in fact, out there remember, in I think land, I, but I, there shouldn't be. I mean, people I think are scared I said by last scared week, by. I think I said last week when we were filming, hmm. I want you to see this because I want to know if it actually is scary or if I just remember it as terrifying. Um, so let's start. So let's start our discussion with my answer to that question. And my answer to that question is, I am unsurprised, and I, I this isn't this is going to sound snide. I don't mean it snide. I'm unsurprised <laughs> that it scared you. Yeah. But I don't think it's that scary of a movie. That, that and, doesn't offend and me. Both both of those things. So so the reason I think both of those things are that it hits a lot on a lot of the things that you have said repeatedly scare you and structurally and and like as a movie it does enough things that i find infuriating in terms of filmmaking techniques that, that it just continually took me out of the movie so okay so if i were to find it scary because let me say this let me say this it is functionally just a straight up reimagining almost a full remake yeah. of the texas chainsaw massacre yes and when i saw it i was like this is just Texas Chainsaw Massacre, except just more evil. And and I can it's see it's almost I can like see that. Texas I can... Chainsaw Massacre plus like a modern day. Um, what do they call those places when people turn their houses into um, like a um, like you walk through like a maze or somebody like a, like during Halloween? What do they call yeah. those places? What do they call those places? Haunted houses. I guess, but like it's a haunted, yeah. But I mean, like, but like a haunted house in it, like you're walking through it because yes. I feel if I remember the movie, it's like trying to get out of this house. Yes. And yes. yes. And it just keeps going, and the more it goes, the more awful things become, and like yes. more otherworldly, terrifying. And I was like, those things. By the way, like there's a place, there's an amusement park in Southern California called Knott's Berry Farm, which is one of the first amusement parks in America, mm -hmm. and. And uh, uh, that's probably not true. I think it's definitely the first amusement park in California. I'm not but judging. I'm not going to fact every, check you. But every year, uh, but every year uh, for like a month of the year, they turn it into Knott's Scary Farm. Awesome. And they have zombies walking around and terrible creatures. And awesome. I haven't been since I was in high school. But the big attraction is you go into these different haunted houses that are all urban and scary. And it's just you walking through while things try to grab you in the face. <laughs> right. And like I get that these are just hired people, but it's like at least again last time I went I was 14, 15. Sure. Sure. But it, I was not I it's not. That's not okay for me. Yeah. I don't like walking along and then turning around and there's like a ghoul like I'm going to eat your face. I want I want to say this. Okay. I find Texas Chainsaw Massacre abjectly terrifying. Yes. It is it is truly I mean, just because I don't want to do the math in the moment, it's absolutely one of the top five scariest movies I've ever seen in my life. Yes. Probably, and it wouldn't be number five. Like, it is right. it is terrifying. Right. Um, and it is terrifying because it it is plausible. I mean, I don't know how plausible it is, but but it, seem, it is made to seem plausible. It is shot... It is completely within the realm of reality or feels yes, that. Yes, it is shot... I mean, I mean, some of the filmmaking techniques make it seem almost like a documentary. Oof. And it is... Can I it say something about straight that? Straight up terrifying. Can I say something about that? Yes. Woof. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and House of Thousand Corpses. My problem with it is one of my problems with it is you never ever forget you're watching a movie, and I get that 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 that, that Rob Zombie doesn't want you to, right? Like like you wouldn't do the things that he does if he wanted you to forget that you were watching a movie. And when I say that, he will he will cut he cuts in clips, seemingly at random, but it's always to sort of serve the metaphor, seemingly random of people getting tortured, of other parts of the movie, like he'll reference back. And it's it's always done in sort of like a it looks different. Um like it's done in like a like a like vi visually it's clear that you're watching a a a flashback or a or a cutaway and it's also just a bunch of images so yes. obviously and also he 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 messes with the color palette like sometimes he'll show you yes. it in negative 
or it looks like you know the heat seeking like the infrared like the like the uh like the predator <laughs> you know I mean, I feel like he's vision. trying I feel like he's trying to film a nightmare and I would agree with that and I think I think I'm glad you said that I think that is the, the overall the overall feel of it that feels like what he's doing but mm-hmm. it just didn't work for me it just I just and and I mean maybe it's because maybe it's because nightmares tend to build from like when I have a nightmare, they tend to build, but every time it cut away, it was cutting away at a moment when I was, when like dread was building mm. and then it was like, Oh nope, just a movie. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. No, it does. And I think, I think like I was a perfect audience member for this film because it was literally like, I don't see horror movies. And I went in and was, first of all, scared about the fact that I was seeing a horror movie because I am a total wuss. I mean, I just am. And then was like everything that happened, I was like, oh, that's awful. Oh, that's awful. And like the fact that there was like any cutting off, like you're talking about film criticism, which is fine. Yeah. I would not have been able to achieve that. <laughs> like I'm now well, at the point with zombie movies where I can really get into like conversations about them. Sure. And but I and and which means I may be able to start doing that with horror movies at some point. Mm-hmm. But it really is like this undiscovered country for me, to quote Shakespeare, as one should, <laughs> when they are talking about Rob Zombie. <laughs> and so for me, it was literally just him just being like, "Hey," and I had seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but uh, one of the few I'd seen. So, but it was like, but I saw it. If you'll recall, I saw it with the director's commentary going, with the lights on, on a television while people were walking around me, and I was still scared. So to see this movie in a movie theater with the lights out, like with just, and it was like, he was like, how do I just make it horrific? I think that was the thing. Yeah. Not dread, yes. not, not, not dread, not um, fear, not, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, dread is the major thing, or like this anxiety of what's going to happen, but just sort of like, how do I just pile on horrible things onto the screen? <laughs> to the degree that if I remember correctly, and by the way, I am, I am remembering this movie from the one time I saw it 10 years ago. Sure. The climax almost, isn't there like this weird spider-like guy in like a mask, like a gas yeah. mask? Like, what? Yeah. What? No, it, he, yes. He, he, he clearly, he clearly, he is, the, the conception of this movie, the art direction of this movie I, I guess it would fall under our direction. It's not a failure on that term, and 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 I want to I want to be very clear about something. I mean, I'm being clear about something that is still just my opinion, but mm-hmm. but nevertheless, uh, Phil, I, I think that I think that this all hinges on the fact that you just hadn't seen many horror movies. I'm not Fair saying enough. that people who had seen a lot of horror movies couldn't find this scary, but did you think that all the major bad guys were creepy? Yeah, I thought they were creepy. The bald guy whose name I cannot remember is, to me, a just a terrifying human being. Uh, Captain uh, Spaulding. Well, yeah, yes, whatever his yes. real name is in real life. Oh, Sid Haig. Yeah. He's yes. scary. Yes, yes. Like if I met him in real life, I'd feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> sure. I, I, although white face paint does not help. No. Um, here's, here's, here's what I mean. Like... I think I think that's accurate. I think you when you said like I approach it from a place of film criticism, I, I do. But that's not how. But just to be clear, because I am extraordinarily pretentious, but I am not quite as pretentious as that makes me sound. I don't sit down in a movie and go, Ugh, that no, film, I didn't mean it like to, no, no, no. I know, I know you didn't. I know you didn't. Right. But but just to but if if someone were to watch this podcast or listen to this podcast and and think to themselves, should I see this movie? Here, here is here is the process. All right, I just sat down and I wanted to be entertained. I wanted to be scared, right? Yeah. And yet, at the end of the movie, I had not been. Yeah. And I, and so I at that point I looked back and I was like, so so what? Where did I find myself getting annoyed when I should have been getting scared? And that's and that's that's what happened. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Yeah, very yeah. much so. You um. Know, uh, it's got it's got a bunch of people in it that I like. Um, Rain Wilson Black is, is great and yeah. and creepy. Uh, 
Uh, Rain Wilson. Yeah. Who did you say? I think I said Rain Wilson. Yes. Uh, uh, Chris Hardwick, which is weird because he's best known for being the host of a game show that I never actually saw. I did. Singled out. But no, now um, he's best known as doing the Talking Dead. That's right. That's which right. is an incredibly highly rated show now. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. That's true story. Extremely interesting to me. Um, it's uh, and and it's got it's got uh, it's got Walton Goggins, one of my favorite people in the world. Is he uh, in that? He is. He's the he's the deputy. He's the wow. he, that when when like the dad of one of the people that's captured goes. Uh, He's uh, he's and and the two police officers go. One's like the sheriff. The other one is is the deputy. He's the deputy, um, and and you know I can see I can see like I don't I don't. When did the first Saw movie come out? Because oh, two thousand two, I think. Did it? Yeah. No, two thousand four. Okay, so. Oh. So, uh, but it, but the screenplay was written in two thousand one. <laughs> so, I believe I think the first Saw movie is not. And we've talked about this on 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 the podcast before. We talked about how much we don't like torture porn as right. a, as a genre. I think the first Saw movie is not torture porn. Mm-hmm. I think every single sequel is. I yeah. don't think House of a Thousand Corpses is torture <laughs> porn, but a lot of torture happens in it. Yes. Um, um, it is elevated right. out of that, frankly, by Rob Zombie's wish to do something else with it. He is proving a point, or he is filming a nightmare or a fever dream. Um, and it is interesting visually. Unfortunately, for me, what made it interesting also, frankly, made it not that scary. And what made it interesting for you specifically? Just the, the all stuff, the the stuff we were talking about. Doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I, I don't think I don't think. By the way, when I say, um, I don't think it makes you snobby. I think you you watch enough movies and you watch enough movies in a specific genre. And I mean, horror is a specific genre. You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. got a genre movie, and you expect certain things to happen. And so you're watching it. And even if you're not, I mean, it's not a matter of like having your little checklist and going like, oh, it has right. this. Right. It's just. You you are able to like when we watch zombie movies, we're now predisposed to ask the question, what is this saying about our culture? Like you can't help yes, but ask yes. that movie question. And you've got and there's certain things you're just ready for. Like my wife, when we watch Walking Dead now, she's now fully sorry, the camera's moving. I didn't mean to do that. She's <laughs> she's fully invested in in zombie stuff now. Like she wasn't when Walking Dead started, but now she's like I, I she goes, I still just can't fathom why that guy rides a Harley. Like it just Awesome. Like yes. she's like his legs are exposed. It's really loud. You know, like it just seems like the most impractical vehicle. So like that that awesome. is an example. Whereas for the first season, she was just like, oh, oh, god, oh. <laughs> now she's like, I, I can't believe that. You know, I think she's. It's amazing how good Andrea's got with that knife. Like it's a totally different yes. conversation. Indeed. And so I think you're able to watch a horror movie and be like, okay, yeah. And it's not a matter of being snobby, although it can lead to that. But for me, I'm still at the point of like, what just happened to my face? <laughs> and I kind of want to watch now. It for some reason this makes me all want to watch it all over again just to see if I'm still scared of it. Sure, sure. No. I don't know what we've been talking about this for six months, and I am not biting the bullet yet. But clearly, <laughs> horror movies are beckoning me in some fashion. Nice. So, I, is there anything else you want to say? I, I mean, I'm, 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 you know. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. I saw it, which is sort of damning I'm, it with I'm the interested, biggest phrase possible. This is gonna. I want to be careful how I say this because I, I want to sound like a nice person, a good person. Um, okay. Let's see if I can say this intelligently. <clears throat> Rob Zombie's wife is ridiculously attractive. Yes. And I'm interested in how he uses that both in this movie and in Devil's Rejects, which is I'm trying to think of another horror movie and maybe again I haven't seen very many. Where, like, the dichotomy between just... And she's not just pretty, because here's the thing. She is really pretty. But yeah. she's also... She's pretty in a way that looks... She has the potential the potential to seem innocent and nice. Yes. And he uses that irony a lot. That's and true. I'm wondering if that... I, mean, I guess I'll just ask you. Is that something that, that you see in a lot of horror movies? Like, the character that... You're almost like no, she can't be evil because she's too pretty and oh, innocent. Oh sure, I mean I, th- I think so. 
Because because I think I think I mean how often I mean it's a trope of the genre, right? I mean Cabin in the Woods played with this. The Virgin survives. Uh, the the slut <coughs> or or whore does not, right? I mean it just that, that's just what. Sure. Right. But then but then as people as as sort of the genre sort of grew up, people started playing with that and playing with your expectations. And sure. I think I think that's where we are now. I mean, I mean we're still in a place where where, you know, the innocent doesn't the innocent as a as an archetype has to be subverted in some way. Okay. Um and and the correlation, the the loose woman uh the the figure of temptation um is sort of like eve with the apple or eve before the apple as right. it were um both of those things have to be subverted or else you're just or else you're just you're not really doing anything interesting right right um and and one thing that i will say about the horror genre it tends to attract people who at least on some level want to do something interesting right yeah, uh, they they might they might think they might think that different things are interesting <laughs> than than say I would, but w- whereas like I don't I don't I don't see a lot of I don't see a lot of uh, horror movies that I think were just made for a paycheck. I think that makes well, uh, I mean, not on the part of the studio, not on the part of the studio, on the oh, part of the true. on the part of the filmmakers, the actors. I don't. I don't think. Those... I think the actors. I think the actors will take a gig, but I and that's why a lot of times they'll get naked right, and all that right. other stuff. But I know. But I do know. But I'm not trying to. Uh, contrary to my arguing with two of your points, I still actually am not trying to argue it. I think you're probably right. I think that. Sure. The, I think that the people who are into the horror genre, that is a thing they love, mm-hmm. and they're and and I and I will say I think that it attracts more creativity in a lot of ways than oh I don't know romantic comedies. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah, like, um, oof. I, the last thing I'll say, the last thing I'll say specifically just because Sh- Sherry Moon Zombie is Rob Zombie's wife, uh, Spring Breakers, which I saw over the weekend, yeah. uh, one of the four girls is played by the director's wife. Right. Um, and she How- is the one that, I'm not going to say that the most intense things happen to, but she's, she's the one, she's the only one that gets naked. Uh, she is the one that gets into a situation that is sort of unlike any of the others. Uh, it's it, and and interesting. And I just I'm, I'm fascinated by like the dinner table discussion about that. I, like, I, I'm always interested in how and how husbands cast their wives and like what they yeah. do. I'm, yeah. I'm it's a little like like Brian De Palma was with Nancy Allen and he and he killed her like three times in movies and made her strip down. I mean. Right. Yes, he cast her in. Uh, I, uh, blow, I mean, blowout. Like yeah. you were yes. either married or together at that point. And, and Carrie she is put through the ringer in that movie. And, and and Carrie. And another movie, which name I think it's called. There's another movie that they made together that I can't remember the name of, and she plays like, so, like a, either a prostitute or somebody that he kills. I mean, it's just like yeah. Okay, De Palma, <laughs> and then uh, and then. Uh, I mean, Woody uh, Allen. Scorsese, well, Woody Allen, but then he just does those things to them in real life too, so it's very clear. Um, <clears throat> um, but then Ileana Douglas was with Martin Scorsese during the filming of Cape Fear. And, yeah, and De Niro's I did not know that. And De Niro's character is not good to her. No, is not good to her at all. Um, Mamet casts his wife Rebecca Pigeon, and he casts her. In my eyes, he casts her. Never, he never really does those things to her as far as I can remember. Right. I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to have to, have to triple think that. But um, other, other than that, I mean, yeah, you see these people like uh, you, yeah, and Rob Zombie casts his wife as, um, you know, evil, yeah. but super attractive the entire yes. time. Well, I mean, I think, I think there's something to that, right? Like, like the seductiveness of depravity. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm just going off of House of Thousand Corpses sure, sure, here. Sure, sure, I haven't sure, seen sure. Devil's I wouldn't be opposed to seeing it, but I, I would mean, be interested. I, mean, I would be interested in seeing what you thought about that as well. But I'm not going to go so far as to assign it to you. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, so that's that's. I guess are we done? Yeah, we're done. All right, that's our that's our. Discussion. I'm going to watch the Omen. I'm going to watch the Omen. Probably not this week. I don't know if you knew this. 
But this is the busiest week of the church here. It's called Holy Week. First of all, I'm not going to watch The Omen on Holy Week, just for the record. Okay. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm not going to do that to Jesus. But um, we've got, I've, got a serv- I've got two services on Wednesday, a service on Thursday, two on Friday, one on Saturday, and two on Sunday. So, and they're all about Jesus. So I'm not going to watch weird. The Omen. So I'm not going to watch The Omen. Well, it's a good thing. But I'm not going to watch The Omen this week. But next week, post-resurrection... <laughs> when I'm feeling the power of God and feeling like, what could possibly ruin this? Then I'll watch the movie about the, the son of the devil being born. Then I'm in. It's fair. I think, I think that's a fair point. I think that's a fair, solid call. Well, I'll have Holy Spirit power then, and I'm ready for that. There you go. So, okay. You're not, you're not, you're not ready for the omen. I'm just telling you now. Okay. It's going, it's going to st- watch it during the daytime. For me, okay. j- just watch it during the daytime. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and there we go. This is uh, this has been another Second Breakfast podcast. I'm Andy Roth, alongside Phil Duvall. We'll see you again real soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.